Matthew 24 is going to take us into the wonderful world of end times. For 2,000 years, every generation of Christians has had people who thought that theirs was the last. Without fail, there's always people who think that Jesus is coming back in their lifetime. And we who live today know that that's still very prevalent. Uh, In fact, I might guess that probably most of you might think that that's the case. I don't know. But uh, today also, one of the things that's going to be scattered throughout this message are history lessons. So if you like history... You're going to have a special treat today. If you don't like history, I think you're still going to. I'm not a big history buff myself. I mean, I like some history. Sometimes I get bored with it. But the history that will be shared today, I I found personally fascinating myself. History lesson number one is a little bit of history about predictions of Jesus' return. Hippolytus of Rome predicted Jesus' return to be in the year 500. So he thought the world was created 5,500 years before Christ and that he would return at 6,000 years. And so that's what he thought was going on. In the year 1213, Pope Innocent III predicted that Muhammad was the Antichrist and Islam was the beast and that the end was approaching. In the 1200s, Joachim of Fior predicted that the millennium would begin by 1260. Jean de Roc... Talad predicted the Antichrist to come in 1366. Uh, Sandro Botticelli believed he was living in the tribulation and that the millennium would begin in the year 1504. There were at least three more millennial predictions in the 1500s, at least three in the 1600s. The 1700s had a few things going on. One group that was called the Shakers. Don't know if you ever heard of the Shakers. But they believed that the second coming would be through a woman whom they determined to be Anne Lee. Uh, That didn't happen. Uh, And in the 1800s, a 64-year-old self-described prophet, Joanna Southcott, claimed that she was pregnant with the Christ child who would be born on Christmas Day that year. Christmas Day that year came, and on that day, she died. And an autopsy showed that she wasn't pregnant at all. And uh, there were other things in the 1800s, including the president of the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witnesses calculating that 1874 was the year of Christ's second coming. And uh, they still maintain that to a degree that it was in, turns out, turns out it was an invisible coming. All right. Uh, William Miller was a Baptist preacher during that time who founded a group that became known as the Millerites. We're getting into some more popular uh, groups, names that you might have heard of. He calculated and recalculated several dates for Jesus' return. After the last one in 1844 failed, that time became known as the Great Disappointment to his followers. And some of his followers ended up founding Seventh-day Adventism. Herbert Armstrong, self-proclaimed apostle of the Radio Church of God, whose ministry was initially based in Oregon. Eventually, he moved to California. But he predicted that Christ would return in 1936, and then 1943, and then 1975. Edgar Wisenant uh, mailed out 300,000 copies to pastors of his book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. That book ended up selling 4.5 million copies. And it didn't happen. And then he recalculated with another book for 1989, and then another book for 1993, and then another book for 1994. Uh, Heaven's Gate guru Marshall Applewhite saw himself as one of the two witnesses of Revelation and preached that access to heaven, this one gets weird. Have you ever heard of the, the, the crazy comet cult? Um, this is those guys. Uh, I don't remember the name of the comment, but he taught that access to heaven was accomplished by death and transportation and outer space flying saucers. And that ended up being a suicide cult. Harold Camping, really famous name, a radio broadcaster who predicted the rapture to occur on May 21st, 2011. This was after his failed prediction in 1994. 
And Christians, a lot of people followed him and fell into financial ruin because they spent their life savings uh, buying billboards to promote this and, and also doomsday prep. And so you might not even know that Jerry Falwell predicted the appearance of the Antichrist by 2009. Currently, we have predictions of 2024. Almost, almost done with that one. 2025, 2028, 2029, and 2057. Those are the more popular ones. Now, unless somebody here wants to throw their hat in the ring. Um, or if you go to Reddit, you can find, you know, probably every year. So we learned last week, we were warned not to major in minors. And we don't want to do that as we jump into Matthew 24 and we start learning about you know, the end times, about the tribulation, about the idea of a rapture, the millennium, and Jesus' return. So I want to start by making it clear that we, it, it's okay to study and to develop opinions about how you think things are going to happen. You know, to have opinions about the rapture and the millennium and things like that. That's good. You should. That's okay. But we should be far more focused on being prepared for whatever does happen, whenever it does happen, at all times being prepared for Jesus' return. And God, we ask you for that this morning, that you would help us to prioritize rightly, that you would help our hearts to be set on being prepared, no matter what, no matter how, no matter when, and that we would be about our Father's business. And so I pray today for conviction and strength and courage and uh, wisdom to grow in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're only going to work through the first 14 verses today. Uh, we're going to start with the first three kind of, and then we'll, we'll read the rest and, and work through those. But verses one and two, as Jesus left and was going out of the temple. So we've had this whole long, you know, series of, you know, period of sermons where he was at the temple and now he's left and his disciples came up and called his attention to its buildings. And he replied to them, do you see all these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. So we start with Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple. And he's not talking about his body this time. He's talking about the temple. And then in verse 3, while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, so now they've moved there, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So here's where we got to start doing work. Because Matthew 24 is one of the most disagreed upon chapters in how to interpret it. And the interpretation starts by figuring out what, as we move forward, what questions is Jesus answering? And there are some who say that, well, he's, he's answering different things in each paragraph. And there are some that say that he's answering two separate questions, like he's going to answer one when will the temple be destroyed? And then another separately, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And some people say that the first part of the chapter is all about the destruction of the temple, which did happen in the year 70. So they see everything in the beginning, at least through verse 28, and some even through verse 35, as being strictly about that period of time and that prediction of the temple being destroyed and not having any further fulfillment in the future. And then in verse 36, they would say he begins to answer the question about the end times. But others say that Jesus is answering both questions throughout, and he's kind of like flipping back and forth. And so you have to treat every paragraph independently. And others say, no, it's all the future. Like he, when he starts after this, he's not even talking about the temple anymore. He, he said it's going to be destroyed. And then he goes into answering questions about the end times. And then others say, well, it's both. All right. So he like as we move forward, he is talking about the temple, but not just the temple. It's the temple being destroyed and the times leading up to his return. 
And so there's a near and a far fulfillment. Okay? And every idea has challenges. Like none of them are without parts where you're like, well, what about this? You know, that you have to kind of deal with. Some have more challenges than others. And as we study the chapter, I will talk about how other people view certain things. Uh, but I will say that my leaning is that what we are studying today is not just about the time leading up to the destruction of the temple. I think there are too many problems with that interpretation. I think the best uh, way of looking at this is that there is application both, yes, to those times, but also to all time between then and Christ's return. And so that there is both near and far happening. And I want to begin by saying that I don't think the question itself was separate in the disciples' minds. I mean, we, we kind of got to remember who's asking the question, too, and what their framework was. See, because they didn't even have an idea of a far off second coming. Like that wasn't something in their minds. They didn't even envision Jesus leaving them at all. You know, they're, they're talking about him starting his reign, right? And so they're thinking, Jesus, the Messiah is here now, and he's going to start his reign like at any time right here and now. And so when Jesus says that the temple is going to be destroyed to them, they're like, he's talking about the end. They're not thinking like he's talking about this and then something else there. It's all together like the temple being destroyed. That must be the end. When is this going to happen? And now, I'm not saying that means automatically that Jesus isn't talk, talking about two different times, but it is something to think about as he's answering their question. And furthermore, we need to cover a couple preliminary dispositions that we have, uh, depending on our views, before we really dig into this chapter, things that impact how you read and interpret it. And one of those would be a person's millennial disposition. Now, the millennium uh, churchy word, a theological word, the millennium is the 1,000 years of Christ's reign that the Bible talks about. Now, the Bible talks very little about it. It's like six verses in Revelation 20. There's a whole lot about like the tribulation times and stuff like that, but the millennium, there's very little about it. And so people have different ideas. Now, a premillennial position sees the millennium as being a literal 1,000-year period that comes after Christ's return, where he reigns on this earth physically. A post-millennial position believes that the millennium is a figurative, not literal 1,000 years, but a figurative spiritual reign that happens before his second coming. And an amillennial position is a lot like the post mill with a big difference that we're about to get to, but also a figurative spiritual reign before the second coming. With a post mill, they don't necessarily believe that the millennium has been going on the whole time. Um, it, it happens at some point before his second coming. With an all mill, the millennium has been happening the whole time, you know, in the church age. Okay? And. Another aspect of this that determines, you know, that is a difference of these views is the question of do, do things get better or worse as we get there, you know? And a premillennial position believes that the world gets worse as we get closer to Christ's return. A postmillennial position believes that the world gets better. And that's the big difference between it and the all mill. And so in a postmill view, Actually, there comes a time of like this Christian influence around the globe that the world becomes more and more Christianized and, and that it gets better and better and better. And the church kind of ushers in Christ's return in that way. And an alt mill position like the pre mill believes that the world gets worse. And so you can see how the way that you view these things could determine how you would interpret a chapter where Jesus is talking about the end times, right? So when Jesus talks about, as we're going to read soon, how bad things are going to be, a post-millennial has to do something with that. And also, they don't believe in a seven-year tribulation, and so they have to do something with that later on in the chapter. 
And so what, what do they do with that? Well, that means they read a lot of the, this chapter as being about, at least the beginning of the chapter, as being about the time leading up to the destruction of the temple and not being about the future. And in all mill, again, I mean, they don't have, they believe different things about their tribulation. They don't all believe the same things. But an all millennial person in general is going to interpret end times prophecy less literally than a premillennial position. And so they have to do something with that. And then there's a couple that I didn't put up there. There's a uh, pro mill and pan mill. Uh, pro millennial position says I'm pro whatever uh, God does. And a pan mill says, ah, we'll see how it all pans out. And so maybe that's where you are. And uh, see, Brendan, that's where you are. But I, maybe you'll have some convictions at some point. Uh, so with all that being said, well, first, let's understand again, none of this is worth dividing over. All right. These are third string issues. All right. They're, they're not they don't determine whether someone's a Christian or not. And they shouldn't even determine whether or not we are in the same church. Like we can be in the same church and have different ideas about these things. And so with all that said, let's jump in. What does Jesus say? In verse 4, he replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of labor pains. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, so there's people out there, like I said, who will say all of this that we just read, it's just about the years leading up to the to 70 when the temple was destroyed. And there's good reasons to believe that these things were fulfilled in, in a way. Like messianic pretenders did come. There was war, famine, earthquake, persecution, church infighting, false teachers. The love of many grew cold in the days of Nero's persecution. And when it comes to the spread of the gospel to the world, we do have Paul saying in Colossians 1, 6, he's talking about the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing. So we have that kind of language being used. Again, Romans 16, 26, the gospel has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Now, so the idea of the gospel had been proclaimed to the inhabited world, you know, of the time, to all the nations that existed. But I still am not convinced that it doesn't have future fulfillment, that he's only talking about those times. For one thing, Jesus said that he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures to the end of what? The end of the temple? I, I think that's a little bit strange, you know, to say the he who endures to the end of the temple will be saved. I mean, I don't I don't get that. I think he's talking about the end of the age, like the, the disciples asked the question, when will these when is the end of the age? And again, he says the gospel will, will be proclaimed and the end will come again, the end of the temple. Why? I think he's talking about the end of the age. But also, there was a lot of fulfillment of these things in those times leading up to the destruction of the temple. And so I am coming into this with a perspective that the characteristics of the Christian life that we just read about are not only characteristics of the lives of Christians in those years leading up to the destruction of the temple, but are characteristics of the Christian life in general, of Christians' lives 
for all time until Christ returns. And I think there's a case to be made that they will be increasingly escalating as we get closer to Christ's return. And what are those characteristics? Well, the first one is religious deception. He says, many will come claiming to be the Messiah. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. We've been talking about false teachers. They come in in different forms. Not all of them are going to literally claim to be Jesus. All right, that's not what he's saying. But they are going to claim to be a Messiah figure, a savior type person. Though some of them will claim to be Jesus. There's a guy in Australia right now who says that he's Jesus. All right. And he's got a wife and she's married. And, you know, you can look those them up some other time. But and I can't give you hard numbers on how many deceivers there are in the world or have been in the world at any given time or how many people are being deceived at any given time. I live in the world now, and I would say the numbers are high. And I would make the case that deception is probably at an all-time high, if for no other reason than the ease of deceiving and spreading those messages. At no other period in history has it been so easy for a false teacher to spread their message and to deceive others. They don't need a horse and buggy anymore. They don't need a car. They don't even need a plane. The world is at the click of a button. You can get computer bots to disseminate your message for you 24 hours a day without you even having to do anything. And and what is rapidly increasing as we speak? Artificial intelligence. So it's only going to get easier to deceive people if for no other reason than it's going to get harder to know what is true and what isn't. You think it's hard now? I mean, wait until deep fake videos and photos are, are so real that we can't tell the difference at all. And not even just us, but forensics. What, what happens then? We won't have photo and video evidence admissible in court. We won't be able to figure out what went on. And, you know, wait until people are from the comfort of their own home are making fake videos of uh, pastors saying things that they never said. You know, and, and all kinds of havoc that can be created. So religious deception isn't going away. History lesson number two. Since 1800, the estimated Christian global population has grown by about a factor of 13 times. Okay. That's a, that's a lot. Christianity grew a lot. But Islam grew over 21 times. Agnosticism over 2,300 times. Atheism over 13,000 times. It's estimated that the population of uh, Muslims will basically match that of Christians in the world by 2060. And that's, those numbers are deceitful anyway, because when you talk about, when you look at these stats, what is labeled as Christian is going to include a whole bunch of stuff that's not actually Christian. And so even within the smaller sphere of Protestant Christianity, fewer and fewer are going to be labeled as evangelical Christians. And even within that sphere, fewer and fewer are going to hold to biblical truths. And so the numbers are going to be skewed that way anyway. That's not the only thing thing that we face, though, not just religious deception. Verses six and seven and verse 12 talk about political disruption. Wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, lawlessness. Wikipedia has a a list of several lists of wars throughout history. Um, And I, I found this fascinating history lesson number three, history of war. Um. I I couldn't just like copy and paste these numbers. I had to like work to extrapolate this stuff. And so I did work for this. So you better appreciate it. Um, From the years zero to 999. So we're talking about since Jesus. All right. Uh, That's a thousand year span. They recorded. and, And I will talk about as they record these wars. It's not. I mean, it's a little bit of an over exhaustive list because. 
Uh, like one war will also be listed, like World War II is not just listed as one war, it's, it has several different conflicts in that war they are listed, and so there's more numbers there. Now, it's not like every battle or anything like that, but you know, one war can have, be listed under several different times. And so a thousand year period, they record 248 wars, one war every four years, okay? 1,000 to 1499, a 500-year period, 417 wars, one war every 1 1.2 years. 1500 to 1799, 300-year span, 522 wars, one war every 0 0.6 years. 1800 to 1899, 100-year span, 621 wars, one war every 0.16 years. 1900 to 1944, 45 years, 604 wars, one war every 0 0.07 years. And then we have 1945 to 89, 45 years, 286 wars, 90 to 2002, 13 years, 80 wars, 2003 to present, 21 years, 138 wars, of course, when you look at statistics like this, if you zoom in at any point, so we're seeing like, oh, things are getting better, but that's because you zoom in too close, right? And so if you zoom out and we take maybe 1900 to present, 124 year period, 1,108 wars, one war every 0.1 years, as to compare to maybe 1800 to 1899. Do you see what I see? Escalation, wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, getting worse as time goes on. Lawlessness, I don't have numbers on that one throughout history. That's harder to quantify. I, anecdotally, you know, I can look at my own life and say, it seems like it's gotten worse. <laughs> I mean, I didn't grow up uh, with the idea that I would live with an ever-present, you know, uh, threat of having my car windows bashed in or my identity stolen or having to keep an eagle eye on your kids everywhere you go or that feeling like the police, um, while I appreciate them, probably won't be of much assistance unless there's a physical threat involved uh, or decriminalizing hard drugs, who imagined? Um, I also didn't live in the Wild West, so maybe I'm spoiled. So I'm just, that's just anecdotally. What else do we get to look forward to, guys? How about some natural dysfunction? Jesus talks about famines and earthquakes. Uh, we could add to that list. I mean, he's not giving an exhaustive list. Tornadoes, in the part of the country I grew up in. Hurricanes, uh, volcanoes, that's over here. Earthquakes over here too, but tsunamis, infestations, we could keep going. Uh, also, something that I don't have, you know, I didn't look for numbers throughout. That gets a lot less recorded than wars, uh, natural disasters and things like that can happen when no one's even around to know that it happened. Uh, but we do know that it's been around. We do know that Romans 8.22 says we, the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. All of creation in the pains of childbirth. Nature is groaning. The whales are turning against us. I don't know what's going to happen next, guys. When's the animal revolution going to start? Uh, well, if you believe in a literal seven-year tribulation, then you might look at Revelation 6, 7, and 8, when he opened the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. So it might come. <laughs> How about we add some Christian persecution to our misery milkshake? That's what we see in verse 9, persecution and hatred. George Grant wrote uh, an article about the history of Christian persecution. This is history lesson number four. I want to read some of that article. In the first three centuries from Nero to Diocletian, Roman imperial and provincial persecutions were fierce. 
Tradition tells us of gladiators in the Colosseum, lions in the Circus Maximus, and staked pyres in the Forum as threatening the earliest believers. They were forced into precarious, often secretive existence, living on the margins of society and meeting in catacombs, caverns, and thickets of trees. Despite the spread of the gospel from the 4th to the 6th centuries, the hazards of persecution remained a lamentable feature of everyday life, like the marauding barbarian bands along the Germanic frontiers. The rise of Islam out of the desolate Arabian Peninsula and its subsequent westward expansion posed new threats to Christians throughout Byzantium and across the North African shore. From the 7th to the 11th centuries, the Christian heartland was crushed under the weight of Islamic invasions. The plunder of churches, the rape of Christian women, the torture of priests and monks, the pilfering of villages and towns, and the occupation of the territories sent shudders of horror throughout the West, eventually prompting the efforts of the Crusaders. Throughout the middle, medieval age, Islam remained a persistent danger to believers both in the conquered lands of the old Christian East and along the frontiers of the West. Invading Assassinani armies marched to the gates of Vienna. Marauding Ottoman armies controlled the Eastern Mediterranean. Their pol policy of enforced servitude for Christians who would not convert to Islam threatened to swallow up the last remnants of the faithful. There were other dangers to Christians as well from the Teutonic tribes of the north, from the last of the pagan Viking warlords, and even from overzealous inquisitors. With the Reformation and Counter-Reformation in the 16th and 17th centuries came a new wave of persecution. Many believers were, in the words of Fox's Book of Martyrs, bound to relinquish not only goods and children, but life itself for the glory of their Redeemer. The age of discovery in the 18th and 19th centuries afforded new opportunities for missionary deployment around the world, plunging into the darkest jungles, trekking across the harshest deserts, and sailing along the deepest seas brought new dangers for both missionaries and their disciples. The story of the great missions movement cannot be told apart from the terrible sacrifices made by followers of Jesus. Astonishingly, though, it has been the 20th century, along with the first decade and a half of the 21st, that has seen the greatest increase in persecution. According to ministries such as Open Doors and Voice of the Martyrs, more Christians have been killed for their faith in the last century than in all other ages combined. The lethal assault against the church by the minions of Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, Idi Amin, uh, Mengistu Hale, Meriam, Robert Mugabe, Fidel Castro, Kim Il-sung, and Pol Pot unleashed untold horrors in prison cells, gulags, concentration camps, detention centers, torture chambers, re-education centers, and labor camps, millions were and still are sacrificed on the bloodied secular altars of the proletarian utopia. And now with the rise of a new generation of Shiite, Wahhabi, Salafi, and Sunni jihadists, a new tidal wave of persecution threatens devastation and destruction to Christians and non-Christians alike." End quote. Threats from the outside are what Jesus said we should expect. But not only threats from the outside, but threats from the inside, as we see church division in verse 10. It says, many will fall away, betray one another, and hate one another. We're not talking about disagreements on music, guys. We're not talking about decorations and stuff like that. We're talking about hatred betrayal to a level that you, you, you may have never seen in your own life. I mean, think about, maybe think about a family that was like the worst case of a family being torn apart by an inheritance, you know, and you envision that, but to a much greater degree happening in the church of Jesus, churches. The wolves will show their teeth. The goats will no longer sit idly by pretending that they are sheep, but will instead turn on those who have loved them and warned them for years. You see, as the day draws near, God's church becomes more clear because of the division, because of the sifting that happens. 
And with all of these that I've listed, there is a case to be made that we might expect increasing escalation as we get closer to Christ's return. Maybe the meta, maybe this is stretching the metaphor too far, but he talks about it being as labor pains. And when you think about labor pains, you think about that as you draw nearer to the birth, that the, the intervals between get shorter and the intensity gets stronger. And so I, I, it's not, I don't think it's far-fetched to think that that's what Jesus meant. I also look at history and I'm like, well, that seems to be what's happening. And I certainly look at what I see coming in the near future and think that that's going to continue. So how then should we live? That's the question. What do we do? It's a gloomy picture. Do we just lay in bed? Be depressed? Anxious? Should we get angry and violent? Should we go hide in some caves? No. Jesus tells us how we should live. Now, first, I would say, don't be surprised. You've been warned. Our political landscape is tumultuous right now. And, but I don't understand why so many Christians seem so surprised. They look at the world, they're like, how has our country come to this? Like, what is happening to our world? And exactly what Jesus said would happen. Exactly what he said. I mean, we're, we're like the disciples with the whole resurrection thing. Like, how did this happen? Jesus is dead. I just told you multiple times. So the only reason that you should be surprised is if you are deceived. And Jesus tells us not to do that. He commands us, watch out that no one deceives you. Who is trying to deceive you? Many. <laughs> many false messiahs. Many false prophets. Many reporters. Many politicians. Many companies, even nations, are trying to deceive. And what are they trying to convince you to believe instead of the truth? It doesn't matter. Anything except the truth. You know, they're fine. Like anything, all kinds of things. Jesus isn't God. Jesus isn't coming back. Hell isn't real. There are many ways to God. It doesn't matter how you live. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to pray. You don't need to read your Bible. Uh, you should always be healthy and, and prosperous. Abortion is health care. Suicide is death with dignity. Men can become women. White means that you're racist. Satan doesn't care what lie you believe as long as it's a lie. He doesn't care who you make your Messiah as long as it isn't Jesus. You want Elon Musk as your Messiah? Great. He's fine with that. You want Donald Trump or Kamala Harris as your Messiah? He's thrilled with that. He doesn't care as long as it isn't Jesus. As long as your hope is not focused in Jesus, as long as your love is not focused in Jesus, as long as your time is spent on anything other than following Jesus, he's got you right where he wants you. And how can you not be deceived? How can you keep that from happening? Well, you love the truth. You seek the truth. And the truth is found in the Word of God and the people of God, not in YouTube rabbit holes. All right, like not, God's Word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We are not being enlightened by conspiracy theorists who spend all day trying to disprove the moon landing. That's not enlightening us. We are enlightened by the word of God that we might not be, that we might, that we would hide God's word in our heart, that we might not sin against God, that we might not be deceived, that we might not be distracted, that we might not be discouraged. So don't be deceived. Love the truth and don't be alarmed. That Jesus says that do not be alarmed. Deception, wars, famines, earthquakes, persecution, division. These things must take place. Do not be alarmed. Seems kind of alarming, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but they're false alarms. 
But if we are not surprised and we are not deceived, we should not be alarmed. Our kids shouldn't have to look at their Christian parents at, like, mom and dad are freaking out all the time because they can't handle the world. Like, whoa, where's mom? <sighs> she's popping some pills. She's anxious about everything all the time. Where's dad? I don't know. He's huffing out of that paper bag over there because he watched the news this morning. Oh, dad, why'd you watch the news? Where's mom and dad? I don't know. They've been, been, been in bed all day because of the election. That's not what we want. We're Christians. You're a Christian. Be strong. Wars don't bury us. Elections don't rattle us. Earthquakes don't shake us. We are pressed but not crushed. Persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. We are blessed beyond this curse, for his promise will endure. His joy is our strength. The sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. You're a Christian. What cause do you have for alarm? What can man do to you? What are Satan's fiery arrows when you are wearing your belt of truth? He's trying to deceive and you're like, no, I've got my belt on. He's shooting at you, but you've got your breastplate of righteousness. You're holding your shield of faith. You've got the sandals of the gospel on your feet. You've got your helmet of salvation on your head and your sword of the spirit ready for battle. What are Satan's armies when you ride behind the king of kings shoulder to shoulder with the saints? Why would you be afraid? Why would you be alarmed? Are you, are you alarmed at what you see in your city or your schools or your country or your world? You should not be. You should be concerned. Concern is good. Concern comes from love, but alarm comes from fear. And perfect love casts out fear. Don't be alarmed. You're a Christian. And don't become cold. Lawlessness will make the love of many grow cold. It's good at that. If you're not walking in faith, you're going to find yourself looking around at the world and, and you're going to be angry and increasingly angry. And you're going to forget that lost people are lost people. And you're going to see the lost people as the enemy. When Paul tells us in Ephesians that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I was watching a Mark Rober video recently. He's a guy who used to work for NASA, and now he does science videos on YouTube and all kinds of cool experiments. And um, he was making this box. Well, it's, it all started with someone stealing a, a package from his porch. And he didn't like that. And he wanted to do something about that. And so he made like a, a fake package, a, tra a trick package that would, you know, they would take it and then it was like a glitter bomb that it would explode glitter all over them. And, and there were these different generations of these packages that he made increasingly more complex. And until you got to the point where there's like four phones recording every angle and it's being GPS tracked and there's fart spray coming out and glitter and you know, like uh, sticky stuff on the handles and, um, and there's all kinds of things. And he did this whole, it ended up turning into this whole thing where they ended up tracking this whole criminal enterprise uh, and, and all kinds of things. And he's trying to figure out where these things are going and, and help the police and he's working with them. But you watch these videos and it's, it's easy for hatred to well up because you see people taking things from people's porches and busting 
car windows and you just start to hate. You start to hate the thieves and then you start to hate the people that the thieves take their stuff to and give them money for those things. And then you start to hate that the police aren't doing more about these things. And then you start to hate the politicians for not supporting the police and doing something about it. And then you start to hate the people who voted for the politicians that, that created these more problems. And it's just hate because of lawlessness. And it's good at making our hearts grow cold. It's easy. But we must remember that lost people are lost. And that Jesus told us that this would happen. And I think sometimes we get a little too used to our lost neighbors who act more found for whatever reason. You know, we look at these people and they're not Christians, but you're like, you're a, a, you know, a nice neighbor, a law abiding citizen. And I'm like, why? why? What's wrong with you? Like, why are you obeying the law? You should be acting more lost. Um, and so maybe we get fooled by that. But we're only going to start to grow cold if we are surprised and deceived and alarmed at lawlessness. Which means that, yeah, we've been deceived because Jesus told us all about it. So don't be cold. And there's one last thing. Don't give up. Gloomy picture. I painted this morning. Well, Jesus painted it. We get it, Jesus, you're a pessimist, okay. But then it's like, wait, hold on. He talks about all those bad things, and then he says, this good news of the kingdom <laughs> will be proclaimed. And we're like, what good news? Um, well, the good news, that that's not what he's prepared for us. So for all of this gloomy picture, he says, the good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. It's easy for a Christian to be like, ah, the world's going to burn, let it burn. You know, who cares? But this stuff should not make us less missional. It should not make us apathetic. It should make us more missional. History lesson number five. Tertullian famously said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. As in, it's, it's martyrdom that actually grows the church, that makes it stronger, that multiplies it. Martin Luther said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Carl Henry said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Charles Spurgeon, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. Yes, we look out at a, a dead and a decaying world, but we look out at that world with a message that we know somebody who brings the dead to life. Somebody who washes away the darkest stains. Somebody who warms the coldest heart. And you can know him. So may God give us the heart to march together to the ends of the earth with that message. May God use the deception and disruption and dysfunction and persecution and division that characterize our lives as a broth that we drink for strength and courage. Satan wants to give us that stuff. And he thinks this, he's... Lying, he's deluded. He thinks that it's poison that's going to take us out of the race. But we're going to take the cup, we're going to drink every last drop, and we're going to hand it back and say, please, sir, can I have some more? Because it has all the nutrients that we need to be strong followers of Jesus and to make it to the end. Because he who endures to the end will be saved. So be strong and courageous.